I'm Lucy. And I'm Michelle. Welcome to Tudoriferous, the biographical podcast that examines lives in the Tudor era. And today, Francis Lovell. Mm. Yes, but before we start, yep. <laughs> we have new patrons to thank. Ooh. I want to welcome Kira Benton and Amber Alexander. Thank you so much for supporting us. Yes, thank you very much. It's awesome. Welcome aboard. Yes. Is that the right phrase for uh, Order of the Garter? Probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome in. Yes. <laughs> well, secondly, I have a new item to these episodes. Oh. Well, since so many of our episodes have been inadvertently revisionist, <laughs> yes, I thought I'd ask you now what you expect from Francis Lovell. Okay. Because there have been um, quite a few that we would have got it completely wrong at the beginning. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have now watched The Shadow of the Tower all the way through. That's that uh-huh. 1970s make a film using play, like a theatrical play set. Very theatrical. Very. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lovell was very proper for his gentility, but he was a rebel and actively worked against Henry VII and was supposed to be supporting John de la Pole. But I'm not entirely sure. In the play, they made it seem like he had his own agenda as well, subtly. So I'm going to think he's going to be one of those who's out for himself and himself only. Okay. We'll see if you're right. Okay. And thirdly, we've had a rethink about who does what. So I shall now do two biographical episodes to Michelle's one. And that's because I just have more time than you do. Yes. (laughs) Sorry. It does mean, however, that you do two quizzes for my one, which is very <laughs> gratifying. <laughs> okay. And talking of which... <sighs> Quiz. Question number one. This is about William Stanley. What is his name? William! Woohoo! Got one! <laughs> William's second wife was Elizabeth. Which notorious character was one of her previous husbands? What? You've gone back to questions about not William? It's about his wife. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I have no idea. Notorious. Notoriously. I'd like to say Empson or Dudley then, but I know it's (laughs) not. Mr. Tiptoft. Oh, Earl Tiptoft. Of, Earl, of, Earl of Worcester. Yes. What did William organise during Henry Tudor's march to Bosworth, which we felt was blowing William's covers somewhat? Oh, safe havens, basically, for Henry to get through the Welsh marches. Mm. But there was another thing which was more avert. Giving him towns? Uh, well, he didn't give him a town, but he welcomed in, him into Lichfield. With full yes. military honours, yeah. Yes, basically giving him the town was how I pictured oh, that. Yeah. Yeah, but we thought, you know, tone it down a bit. You're yes. to be incognito. <laughs> You're supposed to be impartial. <laughs> Number three, which two of the highest positions in this land were given to William? And I'll take just one of them, if you want, since it has been a while since, and I forgot to put the uh, script up on the on Google. I'm... I'm struggling to separate him from Thomas. Was he steward? Uh, well, I'll give you a clue. Lord Dobney um, succeeded him. That's not going to help me. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could tell you that Francis Lovell preceded him. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but that's I not going to help you because we him. haven't done the episode yet. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's Lord Chamberlain. Lord Chamberlain. Okay. And also he was Chamberlain of the Exchequer. So far, I've gotten one and my <laughs> my self-appointed bonus point. <laughs> <laughs> which t- uh, Number four, which title was William desperate to have? We felt he was a bit of an Edmund de la Pole about yes, it. Yes, he wanted an earldom. He did. Well, that's a title. Earl of Chester. Chester, yes, because his brother yeah. had Lincolnshire. He wanted Chester. Mm. Yes, that was his seat of power. And number five, what was found in William's home that incriminated him? Apart from quite a lot. 
Was it the coat that was reversible? No, that was John. It was a present. No, I'm thinking of the incrimination was the seals. No, we never found out for certain whether he had sent. No, it's the gold necklace given to him by Edward the Fourth. Right. That he didn't get rid of. Which I still think doesn't really incriminate him. I wouldn't have thought so, but they they were yeah, looking they for something. They did. They were yes. looking for something to, to hang, well, literally to hang off him. <laughs> 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 to hang him for. Oh my gosh, that's my worst one. One point. Well, yeah, as you said, I did forget, because you, normally we put the... Um, the transcript up on uh, on Google Drive for each other to see. So. Yeah, because I do learn better from reading. It's a big gap between the recordings sometimes. Yes. That is enough of that. Let's crack on. Anyway, come with me, if you will, to Minster Lovell Hall. It's the early 18th century and the old hall is undergoing some much needed renovation. The workmen are tired and hot, and we're glad when they can knock off and go home. They've been told to pull up the flagstone so that new foundations can be laid. They've been at it for hours and are thoroughly fed up. But suddenly one of them gives a shout. This flagstone rings hollow, and it has a metal ring set in it. It takes two of them to lift it, but when they have, it reveals a large black hole in the ground. An underground chamber. The foreman lowers a candle on a piece of wire down, down into the hole and almost drops it when the candle lights up a gaunt, eerie face, a skull. As the candle stops buttering, they can see more. A skeleton sitting bolt upright at a table surrounded by books and papers, his quill in his bony hand. And then, before their wondering eyes, the skeleton and all his books and papers turn to dust and scatter to the floor. There you oh, go. I love secret <laughs> chambers. Please, I'm hoping that person didn't starve to death and it was a priest hole that somebody forgot to get him out. <laughs> yes. just, you know, a few months later, they're thinking, you did get him out, didn't you? <laughs> no, I thought you did. Don't open the floor. <laughs> yes. Let's not tell anyone this ever happened. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Did that really happen? Yeah. Woo. That's even better. I have to say that the book from which I got most of the information about Francis's early life was full of words like probably, may, might, it's thought that, it's quite possible that, perhaps, (laughs) it seems reasonable to assume, it can be surmised that, this goes some way to explaining, nothing survives in the historical record, but it has sometimes been postulated that, and we just don't know. And I've taken (laughs) those all from the book. (laughs) But that's pretty much inevitable with childhoods, and much of it is, was extrapolated from what was known of other noble upbringings. Which is what we've been doing for quite a few of these. <laughs> yes. But with Francis, it is adulthood too. Oh no! Mm. I, I've just stuck to what we know with a bit of speculation thrown in. Quite a lot of speculation thrown in. Since otherwise, this, this would be our shortest episode <laughs> yet. <laughs> But a lot of it seems to be the fault of Francis himself and his personality, as we'll see. Oh, okay. So now I'm thinking he was secretive and sneaky. Ah, maybe. Hmm. Born in 1456, he was one of twins. Really? Yeah. And he was called Francis because he was born on the feast day of Francis of Assisi. Of course. It was odd that he was called Francis, though. The Lovells had a strict code that they'd stuck to for 300 years that the first child should be called John, the second William, and the third Robert. Oh. And the twins were probably christened immediately after birth, since twins were less likely to survive. And that's another possible reason for the name Francis. Maybe he was thought to be so unlikely to survive that it was felt that the name John, as the firstborn, would have been wasted on him. Ooh. Hmm. Ooh, this goes back to our Patreon episode... For Anne of Brittany, her unfortunate naming of her children after saints that are yes. not the best. And renaming ones, you know, to, um, having a spare, really, wasn't yes, it? The two the Thomases first... or whatever it was. Yeah, the first Francis died. We'll call this one Francis. Yeah, well, perhaps assumably, assumably they wanted to avoid doing that, so they gave him Francis. Francis' mother, Joan, 
was only 14. <gasps> oh! Young age to be having children, but twins. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Oh, no, not okay. You're having kids. You're a kid. Mm, touch of Margaret Beaufort about it. Oh. Yes. Sorry for the not okay button. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing how much you learn about your speech habits yes. when you're doing a podcast. We ought to have a, a sort of clanking button sound. <laughs> <laughs> Francis' maternal grandfather, John Beaumont, and his son William fought alongside Henry VI in the Battle of Northampton. Okay, so they were firmly Lancastrians. The family firmly was. Lancastrian, yes. Beaumont okay. was to die in the battle in a desperate attempt to prevent Warwick from reaching Henry VI. Okay. And from what I remember of the event, Henry VI was in a tent and Beaumont and others were slashing, they were slashing away outside as a last sort of bulwark between the king right. and the enemy. So, brave man. Yes. Francis' father, John, was also a staunch, staunch Lancastrian. And in 1459, he went to London along with Lord Hungerford, and that's not the one that was executed for buggery, and Lord Scales, and that's not the one who lost his teeth fighting for Isabella. <laughs> they were trying to persuade the Londoners to reject the oncoming Yorkists. That's the Earl of, Earls of Salisbury, Warwick, and March. And March is the future Edward IV. Okay. But much to their annoyance, Londoners refused to do this. For a start, Londoners tend to be pretty Yorkist, don't they? And also, they yes. tend to be quite bloody-minded. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they yes. have a habit of saying... Well, we might have done that, but we're not going to do it now you've asked. <laughs> yeah. They're very keen on their own autonomy. Yes. If you're going to ask for it, that means we're doing what you want. Mm. So we're going to do the opposite because we need to ensure that we have our independence. Yes. And that seems to be what they're doing. John Lovell, Hungerford and Scales went straight to the Tower of London to try and keep the armaments in Lancastrian hands because the Tower was, the London, and it was London's arsenal. Lord Salisbury, once they'd reached the capital, was left in charge of London, while the others went on elsewhere. He blockaded the river so that no supplies would reach the tower. John Lovell and the others retaliated with what's called wildfire, described by historians as a medieval version of napalm. Oh! I don't know what it's made out of. Pitch, naphtha, maybe? Yeah. This hmm. apparently burnt not only the blockaders, but innocent Londoners, including children. Oh. Mm. Well, this was a badly calculated thing to do, since any Londoners, Londoners who might have been on the Lancastrian side weren't for very long. No, no, Because people at don't all. like having their children burnt, do they? No, no, it's a funny thing about people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John Lovell and, other, and the others agreed to surrender the tower on the day that Henry VI was brought to the capital. Scales and Hungerford were given safe passage out of London, but others, including Lovell, were arrested. Hungerford got away, but Scales was killed by the boatman he'd employed to row him to safety. Lovell was tried with the others, but the main players were all released and only the lesser men were executed, which is nice for Lovell, but not very fair, really. No, but it seems to be always the same. Did he have to pay a ransom for his release? I don't know about that. That's all the information I got on that one, since okay. it's not actually meant to be his, his episode. I <laughs> True. <laughs> But how much Joan Lovell and her children, Francis and little Joan, would have known about what John was up to, we don't know, because they were back in Oxfordshire in Minster Lovell. Right. We next hear Francis's father, John, when he was at the Battle of Towton, and it was a particularly long and horrible battle fought in a snowstorm. Lovell survived the, ba survived the battle, but in Edward IV's first parliament in August 1461, he was attainted. Although bizarrely, in Edward's second parliament in December, he was given everything back. Yeah. But as we've said, Edward's quite forgiving in many ways, isn't he? Yes. And it didn't work all the time. No, no, it doesn't always work. People just come back and bite the hand that fed them. Yes. Yeah. The attainder may not have affected the children's everyday life unduly. The house in which they normally lived was part of their mother's dowry, and so not affected by John's attainder. Oh. But although the attainder was short-lived, it plunged the family into debt and John was forced to sell several manors. But on the plus side, the children now saw a lot more of Daddy. Although yes. whether this was a good thing or not, we shall see. I'm 
amazed that her lands weren't affected by the attainder because her lands go to her husband when they get married. It's supposed to revert back to her if he dies. Yeah, but sometimes they put in a special clause, don't they? Because we've come yeah. across that and you think, oh, that, that man was quite accommodating for for the time. Right. Yes. So well, maybe they did that. If, if they did, it was smart. Her. Yes. And that would have been her dad, I should think, since she was only 14 when she had the oh, children. Goodness. In 1464, the twins had a baby sister. Now, is this Frieda's Weeder? Or Fried's Wide. I'm never quite sure. <laughs> I like your first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll call her Frieda's Weeder. Sounds very Anglo-Saxon, doesn't it? It does. There was a seven-year gap and no indication that there were other children who died. So it's not known why the gap. Unless she said, I'm never, ever going never. through that again. You are not touching me ever <sighs> yeah. again. Could you imagine having twins at yeah. that time period? And you wouldn't have known necessarily they were... They, no. You were having twins, would you, until the second one came out? Yeah, unless, like, I've seen a few women who had twins and they were very big at the end. Mm. But now we, I imagine we could carry them longer to term. Yeah. Wow. Yes, yeah, so well, what made me think that they didn't expect Francis and Joan to live was be presumably Small. they were they were pre-term. Yes, then, quite unexpectedly, Francis' father died in 1465, aged just 31. And it must have been a sudden illness or accident since he left no will. And Francis Oops. became the ninth Baron Lovell at the age of eight. Okay. John doesn't seem to have been very popular with the rest of his family. Oh. And that is an understatement. Okay. They all seem to have completely detested him. Uh-oh. Do we know what he did? Well, we don't know. There's been a lot of speculation. If you go to St. Ken Elm Church in Minster Lovell, you will see a tomb for Francis's grandfather, but you won't see so much as a headstone for his father. Wow. Mm. The family may have been short of money at the time of John's death, but there's more to it than that. John's brothers had money, and Francis later became rich, so he could have... He yeah, could have one and in later. should have. No. Nope. No, and it's not just an oversight. This is a definite decision. Darn it, now we want to know what he did, because it had to have been bad. Well, tellingly, Joan, Francis's twin sister, chose not to name her first son John, as was customary. Instead, she, ah. she called him Brian. Sorry for any Brian's. That sounded very startled. <laughs> name John have unpleasant connotations for her? If it did, then he was mean to his children, too. Mm. Interesting. I wonder if the reason he was named Francis wasn't because of that. It was because the mom got to decide and she hated her husband and Adam christened before he came home. Possibly. Yeah. Well, it'd be interesting to know a bit about their relationship, but, well, perhaps it wouldn't. <laughs> no. Much later, when Francis was called upon to make arrangements for prayers, which apparently happened when property was sold or fraternities were founded, then you had to um, pay money to a chantery for making arrangements for prayers for, for people you choose. When, when you sell property? Apparently so. Oh. It's not something I've come across before, and it's not something no. that seems logical to us, but... No, unless... Uh, no. No, I couldn't think of any reason for it either. Yeah, I went through the, oh, maybe, oh, no. <laughs> no, I was thinking maybe the monastery did the legal work. No, they had lawyers. Mm. Huh. Yeah. No, I don't... maybe we should do something on paying people to pray, because that was a big thing, wasn't it? It was. An important thing, which is why it's so extraordinary that he asked for prayers to be said for his grandfather, but not, but not his father. Himself. And this is unheard of. And was doubly bad because not only was he not helping John through purgatory, but Francis was risking his own soul. Because he was very pious and organising prayers for others added brownie points to your own progress through purgatory as well. Oh, yes. I thought maybe you were there was some sort of specific caveat for family members. Mm. Well, he'll get the brownie points for other people. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it is odd. Francis's grandfather didn't like John either. His own son. Jeez, what was this guy like? Because if he was dead by the time Francis was eight... Mm, the damage had been done. 
Yes. What could you do in such a short amount of time to have your kids loathe you? Well, there has been speculation, which we'll come to later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Francis's grandfather, in his will, he gave much of his money to his second son and didn't even refer to John as his son, but as his heir, which is a legal description, oh. but not a very affectionate one. No. John's father-in-law didn't like him either. Then why did he agree to the marriage? He probably didn't know what he was like at the time, I suppose. Oh. Well, he referred to him as, quote, John, by the wrath of God, the husband of my daughter, Joan, unquote. <gasps> and you picked him. Good job, Dad. <laughs> yeah. Well, why did they all hate him? Well, maybe either John was a gambler, and that's why they got into such debt, or he was violent and abusive, or both. I'm going violent and abusive because getting mm. into debt doesn't make everybody hate you. They'd be angry, but they may not loathe. Not everybody yeah. would end up loathing you. This sounds like he was universally loathed. He, squirt he squirted Londoners with napalm. I mean, yes, I think that probably says it all, really, doesn't it? Yes, he probably hurt cats when he was a child. Yes, dropped them off high buildings. Within days of his father's death... Francis became a ward of King Edward. For a while, the king kept hold of the wardship, since that meant he got all the money from Lovell Land. Right. And I'm not sure what happened to the mother and sisters at this point. I presume they just carried on living in the Dower House, but we don't hear about them for a bit. Then it seemed that the wardship had been handed over to Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick, because he quickly married the eight-year-old Francis off to his niece, Anne Fitzhugh. Oh. Probably in 1465. How old were they? Francis is eight. Anne is four. Oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. And that's why we think that he married Anne and not one of the older sisters, because the older ones weren't married yet. So it's odd that the youngest one was married first. But she was probably closer in age to right, him. Right, yes. And miraculously, this is one of the few weddings we've come across when a papal dispensation was not required. Because they're, they're hardly <laughs> related at all, these two. <laughs> that is rare. Yeah. It's not known whether Francis is it's not known whether Francis was sent to Warwick's home to be educated after his marriage, or whether he lived with his mother. But putting this little Lancastrian boy into a Yorkist household would have helped because he'd grow up with an affinity to Edward. Right. So Maybe he was with Warwick, because that's really what they wanted, wasn't it? A bit of uh, yes. mind manipulation. <laughs> yes, and if he hated his father, who was a Lancastrian, yeah. it gives him another reason to go for the Yorkist party. Yeah, But either way, despite appearances, Edward IV still had the wardship, because he was still claiming money off the level land. So at this stage, he hadn't given up the wardship, but just let him choose Francis's wife. And okay. this seems to be a concession to Warwick made by Edward, Maybe it's an apology for marrying one of Warwick's relatives to a Woodville. <laughs> and this is the marriage, the infamous marriage of that 20-year-old boy to the 60-year-old woman that yes. upset everybody so much. <laughs> yes. But then rather gratifyingly, she outlived him. Well, gratifying, poor bloke. Rather, rather <laughs> ironically, she outlived him. <laughs> In late 1465, Francis would have learned that 10 months after the death of his father, his mother was to marry again. That wasn't that uncommon. They were supposed to spend at least a year in mourning, but I found quite often as we're going through this that the marriages were arranged and sorted out before that year. If you've got children, it's often, certainly for the man, it was quite a necessity because you needed someone to look after your children. Yes. And also for the woman. Yeah, you wanted a Security, stable family safety. for your children. Yeah. Yes, because you have no voice. You need somebody to advocate for you. Mm. It's funny you should talk about security and safety because she married William Stanley. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> and Stanley was a staunch Yorkist by this point. Joan had been married to a staunch Lancastrian. We don't know her views, but was this a deliberate ploy on her part to rid herself of any taint of treason? You know, I'm not a Lancastrian. Look, I'm married to this, this Yorkist. Huh? Maybe not she bad. just liked William Stanley. Possibly. Hmm. And we're I mean, talking they... about William Stanley the Elder, not not the William Stanley we just covered. Oh no, William Stanley we are? was covered. Yeah. Now you're trying to work out how the hell did she like William Stanley? Yes. <laughs> well, she did. Well, she married him. 
And she might have had a choice this time, because sometimes you did on the second time round, didn't you? Yeah. And maybe well, when he wasn't shouting abuse at Queen's, maybe he was a lovely man. I don't know. Possibly. And I think I wrote in William Stanley's episode that he married Elizabeth Tiptoft, presumably yes. after Joan had died. Okay. Which was a bit vague, since I you know, wasn't particularly interested in Joan at the time. I was interested in the widow of Mr. Tiptoft. Yes. But we have a bit more information. Joan died either in childbirth or soon after due to complications. Oh. And she was only 25. Oh. Mm. Pity, I'd rather, I'd rather like Joan, the little we knew of her. Yes. All I can hope is that her second husband was nicer than her first. So now the children are orphans. Uh, we don't know what happens to the girls immediately after their mother's death. But four years later, they were being brought up in the Fitzhugh household. That's Francis's parents-in-law. Okay. And I don't know why they were there rather than staying with William Stanley, except that Alice, Alice Fitzhugh, the mum, had taken in several children whose parents had died. So okay. maybe she was just a very motherly person. We'll hope for that and not that they were paid to take in the children. Might have been. Hmm. But it wasn't wasn't a hatred of William Stanley because Francis got on well with him. Well, we we can hear about him getting on well with him for many years. So, okay, maybe Stanley just didn't didn't know what to do with two two little girls. Yes. <laughs> when Francis entered the Warwick household, he would have been educated alongside the king's brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Oh. And again, this is yet another of these sentences that start. We don't know how close oh, no. they were at this point, <laughs> but later they became bestest buddies. <laughs> and that coloured the rest of Francis' life, his friendship with Richard. When his wardship was handed over to Warwick, it wouldn't have made much difference to Francis because now Warwick was getting the money for the Lovell lands instead of the king. Right. So it's still bypassing him. Oh, yes. How old is he now? A bit older than eight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering how much how much longer does he have until he becomes of majority? I think he's about 13 Okay, so... Oh, maybe no, maybe a bit earlier. Maybe ten, something like that. So three or four more years. Uh, wow. Quite a bit more, actually. No, it's it's 21 before he gets his majority. Really? Mm. He's got a long wait. 21? Yeah, apparently so. Others got it at the age of... Well, it seemed to be quite fluid. 16, mm. 18, now 21. I've I've never heard of it lasting that long. Well, I think maybe if your warder is Port Warwick, you're not in any position to argue, are you? True. About, about True. He seems like a very forceful character. Yes. Yeah, it's thought that Edward handed over the wardship to patch up what was then becoming an extremely dodgy relationship between the king and the kingmaker. Oops. Uh, but obviously it didn't. By 1470, Francis had left the Warwick household and was living with his wife and sisters with the Fitzhughes. And the reason for this was that Warwick had rebelled against Edward and married his daughter Isabel to George, Duke of Clarence, against Edward's express wishes. Yes. And unfortunately, we don't know Francis' opinions on this. <laughs> and now he's 13, so he probably had some. Yes. But maybe the Fitzhughes thought that he would be safer with them than with Warwick. Which is most likely true. Yes. Well, it would have been, but it was out of the frying pan into the fire, really, because... After Warwick and, and Clarence had fled to the French court and made their peace with Margaret, Margaret of Anjou, Henry Fitzhugh, Francis's father-in-law, decided to rebel. Oh, no! And probably this was to cause a distraction so that Warwick could return to England. Right. Henry Percy, the Earl of Northumberland, wasn't able to quell the rioting, so Edward head, headed north himself. And this put the Fitzhugh rebellion on the back foot because they hadn't been expecting to fight the king so the rebellion just fizzled out. Right. Jeez. Edward decided the best policy was to pardon everyone, and that included Henry Fitzhugh, and also Alice Fitzhugh, Francis Lovell, and his two sisters. Why would he have to pardon the children? Well, it doesn't imply they were involved, but it was, in it was customary to include a blanket pardon on the family so that any taint of rebellion couldn't be held against anyone at a later date. Okay, except they're children. Why? How could you hold it against them? <laughs> he doesn't even have access to the money from his lands. He's got no power whatsoever. No, but I suppose it's peace of mind, isn't it, that no one's going to come and say, aha, but you were in the Fitzhugh household when they yeah. rebelled. Yeah. 
but you're still a child. <laughs> yes. Well. Okay. But then Warwick and Clarence were back, and they beat Edward, who fled to the continent with his his brother Richard, and Henry the Sixth was back on the throne. And apparently Henry Fitzhugh made an application for safe passage to Scotland, because he was already foreseeing that Edward the Fourth would return, and may want revenge on the man who'd caused the distraction, so that Warwick could re-enter England. He was making contingency plans to get his family, including Francis, to safety. Okay. In the event, when Edward did return, this proved unnecessary because he had bigger fish, fish to fry than Henry Fitzhugh, so he didn't go after him. Warwick was killed fleeing from the Battle of Barnet, and that was the one fought in the Folk, where Oxford's men got the emblems muddled up and fought with each other. Yes. Again, frustratingly, we don't know what Francis thought, because he'd spent four years... Presumably he'd spent four years in that man's household. Don't know how much time Warwick was actually there. But we don't know what his opinion of Warwick was. You know, did he like him? Was he frightened of him? Was he a shadow, shadowy figure in Francis' life? Did Francis resent the fact he was getting the money? Did they even meet? I don't know. Annoying, isn't it? Yes. So Francis had been a ward of the king and the Earl of Warwick. So who would be next to have him? In 1471, he was sent into the household of the king's sister, Elizabeth, and her husband, John de la Pole, Duke of Suffolk. Ah. Oh. And he's the senior one, the subject of our third biographical episode, which turned out to be not quite as exciting as we hoped. <laughs> the Suffolk were granted all the manors, rents, properties, etc. that Warwick had had, but the king added a codicil that they could not have anything that Francis would later inherit. Because Edward IV was obviously thinking of Francis' wealthy grandmother, Alice, who was in her 60s, and the king ah. intended to keep part, part of the goodies for himself. <sighs> of course. Mm. Sorry, everyone's called either Joan or Alice. It's confusing. Yes. Apart from Frida's reader. <laughs> <laughs> we saw how John de la Pole Sr. liked to keep his head down and get on with local affairs, rather than getting involved in the rat race that was the court. Which was the smart move. <laughs> and or he was skint, so he didn't have a lot of choice, did he? <laughs> True. But it does seem odd to talk about a man who rebelled against the king like this, but Francis followed a similar plan, because apparently he was a calm, quiet man who didn't make enemies. Really? He's not? Oh. Mm. And now Francis was growing up in the same household as John de la Pole Jr., who was also to remain a lifelong friend. Mm-hmm. Up until 1472, Francis had seen little of his wife, she was 13 now, and after this date, they met more often and were able to get to know each other better. It's nicer than, hey, here's your husband. Go have sleep with him. <laughs> but I'm 13. No, just stop whinging. In 1474, Francis' wealthy grandmother, Alice, did die. Anyway, it's the king who starts raking in the cash, which he used in part to pay his debt to his wine merchant. Oh, jeez. Oh. You know you're drinking too much when you have to steal money to pay your tab. Steal money from a child. Oh, uh, yeah. In 1475, Francis left the Suffolk household and moved into his own ancestral manor, Minster Lovell Hall, presumably to wait for his wife's arrival. And he had a tower built on the corner of the West Wing, and the upper floors were for looking out across the countryside, but the downstairs was guard robes, or blues. Yeah. Yeah, with everything being taken away by the river. So, very healthy. Just don't swim in the river afterwards. And apparently Richard of Gloucester had done something similar with Sudley Castle. So, from that it's been speculated that they were definitely now friends, or at least in contact with each other enough to discuss the finer points of architecture. Finer points? <laughs> <laughs> Not the terms I would have used. <laughs> <laughs> it's building a few holes in the floor. Gosh, and can you imagine the smell of your clothes? And the idea of hanging your clothes in a garter robe was that the smell would keep the moths away from mm. eating your clothing? Yeah, it would keep everybody else away as well, wouldn't yes. it, once you put them on? Ugh. <sighs> when Francis was 21, on the 17th of September 1477, he reached his majority, and the calendar of patent rolls records that he was granted his property in November, which is apparently pretty quick. Hmm. This implies some influence brought to bear by Richard of Gloucester, or the king's sister Elizabeth of Suffolk, or Francis just paid money to get the whole thing moving. 
Well, I'm guessing since Francis doesn't really have money, it would have to have been influential people. I would have so. And if mm. he was that close with Richard, mm. Richard still had a really good relationship with his brother at this point. Yep. I'm presuming his sister did as well. I don't know. We don't hear much yeah. about Elizabeth. She's the quiet one of the family, really, isn't she? Yeah, good girl. <laughs> Just stay out of it. Yes. He's probably at home thinking, oh, what have they done now? Yes. In October of that year, so straight after his birthday, he took the king to court to claim back some land which Francis <gasps> said had been bought by his grandfather from Richard of York. Ooh. And an interesting bit of legal insight... Francis's mother-in-law entered into a bond of surety of £200 with the condition that Francis would accept the findings of the court. What? Yeah, it's an interesting one that it's not automatically assumed that you will accept it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know whether the king had to enter into a similar bond. Oh, I doubt not. it, but still. Interesting. Yeah, I thought so. So if he went against the bond... She'd lose the mother -in -law's money. Mother-in-law's lose, lose a lot of money, yeah. Hmm. Needless to say, the court found in the king's favour and of Francis course. didn't dispute it. And Francis also had a very long-running dispute over land with the king's stepson, Richard Grey. And I read that Francis was most unusual in that he didn't resort to violence. Because apparently that was standard property haggling tactics. Yes, we saw that, where people were actually kicking everybody out of homes and taking military control of them because... They figured they should own that house. Mm. Well, presumably that's what they were stopping uh, Francis doing by that bond. So, yes. yes. Accept it. Don't just go in and take the place. Although he did send men to occupy a manor owned by the Bishop of Winchester that Francis claimed was his. And it's only because the bishop's men let them in without a fight that violence was avoided. Oh. But Francis spent a lot of it this early time of his majority battling through the courts to get what he claimed was his. Mostly unsuccessfully. <laughs> Oh, I say, uh, because I'm feeling bad for him because it sounds like nothing is quite going his way with his own lands. But then I don't actually know if he's if his claims have any valid basis. Well, I suppose he's had three different war wardens, wardens, warders, warders, I suppose. They they were called all of the above. Right. <laughs> so if any or one, two or any of them had sold, sold land... Any to anybody he's then got to follow the paper trail to find yes. out what's happened to his land except and try and get it back the wardens had that authority to sell off the lands and get the money from them mm, they weren't supposed to but some were granted that authority maybe that's why he's mostly unsuccessful then. yes the king would have had to say yes you can mm. Mm. and if he was still trying to keep the Earl of Warwick happy after he had married a Woodville, maybe he did give him the approval to sell off the land. Well, it seemed that Francis spent a lot of time in court. But it is a shocking state of affairs that someone can sell off a small boy's possessions. Yes. And then it's up to the small boy when he becomes a man to try and grapple them all back again. Yes. Although Francis has had the work done on Mr. Level Hall, he and Anne spent much of their time in the north. Following George, Duke of Clarence's execution, Richard of Gloucester also spent more time in the north. He's known to be angry at his brother because uh, he called it, quote, murder by the colour of the law, unquote. Oh. So Richard and Francis may have been seeing a lot more of each other. Around 1480, Francis' twin sister Joan died. We don't know what of. Ah, probably childbirth. Yeah. And in that same year, Francis was made a commissioner of array for the North Riding of Yorkshire, which he did alongside Richard. And this seems to be the first job that he actually did. <laughs> he had previously been made com commissioner for Oxfordshire, but appears to have seen this post as nominal. Oh. I don't know if it was nominal, but that's how he appears to have seen it. Okay. So I'll take the money. But, but I'm not going to do much for it. No. But in, 14, in 1481, Francis went to war. He was part of the army, led by Richard of Gloucester, which invaded Scotland. And although, although the war itself was inconclusive, Francis was knighted for his military efforts. And he was also given permission to knight two other men, one of whom was Richard Ratcliffe, about whom more later. Hmm. I always assumed, before we started doing this, it was the king that did all the knighting. So did I. That's what I'm pondering at the moment. 
Well, I know um, Henry Tudor knighted people, didn't he, when he arrived in Wales, but then because he thought he, yes, but he saw thought himself he was gonna... then as king in waiting or the yes. real king. Yes. But pre- presumably, uh, Francis has been given this permission by Richard. Presumably the king's given Richard the, 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 the right and Richard's passed it on to Francis. What? Did he give him like, uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of this. Yeah. Like, Do you have to give him... Like, is it a certificate you hand over saying you can knight people or... Maybe it was on there and then. And are those knights that you're knighting supposed to be under your authority then? Not sure. Another thing to look into. That's really got me confused. Maybe you're allowed to do things on a battlefield, a bit like being at sea. Oh, right. Like captains on board Mm. can marry people, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, there's no mention of them telling Francis he can marry people, but <laughs> he can knight them. <laughs> but one of the people he knighted was Richard Ratcliffe, and we will hear more about him. The following year, he was present at the Siege of Berwick, which was not really a siege that Berwick immediately capitulated. And after that, he disappears from the records of the Scottish War. And it's thought that he'd probably gone south. Uh, well, he wouldn't go north, would he? I suppose inevitably he'd gone south. It was known from a letter that he'd wanted to go south anyway, but feared that it would reflect badly on him if he didn't join the Scottish campaign. <laughs> so it seems he seems to have done the bare minimum. He yes. gone to Berwick to show his face and then uh, Hello. And turned, turned around and went home. <laughs> then back up quietly. <laughs> yes. He was made a Viscount by Edward just six months later, so there was obviously no bad feeling about Francis leaving Scotland. <laughs> And so it's made, it's been speculated, again, it's speculation, that he may have sustained an injury in Ber- Berwick. And oh. so was invalided home. But I don't know what sort of injury. I mean, it wasn't a proper battle. Maybe he just <laughs> tripped over something. I don't know. <laughs> he was mounting his horse and fell off the other side. Yes. <laughs> Everybody went, just go home. Yes, you're just, you're not built for this sort of thing, Francis. No. <laughs> Go home and build yourself more loos. In 1482, Francis was invited to spend Christmas at court. And the following year, he attended his first parliament. Did he attend as one of the members? Or he just was there to listen? He just turned up. No, I presume he attended as one of the members. I don't think people sat and watched those in those days, did they, like they do now? I I don't don't know. know. It would have been more entertaining. (laughs) It's true. They were were still throwing fists and everything. (laughs) And as I said, he was made a Viscount, and Edward only made two men Viscounts during his reign. But it is hard to see why he chose Francis to be one of them, because he doesn't seem to have acquitted himself with particular merit in war. No, and unfortunately, I'm now picturing him falling off of his horse. Yes. <laughs> he hadn't been at court before, and he hadn't done any high-profile jobs. It seems that his friendship with Richard may have been crucial here. Yes. Well, Edward wouldn't have given him an honour purely based on his friendship with his brother, I wouldn't have thought. So maybe Richard was able to tell Edward that, about things that Francis had done that we don't now know about. Yes, that sounds more likely. Mm. Or maybe Edward felt that since a Viscountcy didn't come with land or privileges, he wasn't going to lose out by the transactions. If oh! Thought, yeah, have one of these. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't. No, I really made the not. assumption they all did. Well, apparently not Viscounts. Huh. Is this before or after he had executed George? After. Then I'm wondering if he was trying to keep Richard happy, so Richard could have asked for it. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. Francis may have hoped for more promotions of this kind from Edward, but in 1483, the king suddenly died. Edward's court was riddled with factions, and it's said that's why he chose Richard as Lord Protector, because he'd been in the North so much that he wasn't part of it. We don't know where Francis was during this time. He wasn't present at Edward's funeral, so we assume he was up north. But he was in London when Richard, who is now protector, arrived with young Edward V. In Shakespeare's Richard III, Francis was said to be party to the execution of Hastings. But that seems extremely unlikely, if not impossible. Yeah. So, yeah. I think Richard was just picking... Shakespeare was just picking a name... Oh, surprise, surprise. (laughs) (laughs) What? Shakespeare made things up? (laughs) He may not have been on Richard's council, but he was soon given commissions by Richard. And these two must have been nominal since they're dotted all over England. And he couldn't possibly have done them all. 
So some of the properties that he'd been in legal conflict about for years were just given to him. So it's oh, it's nice being the best friend of the protector of the king. Yes, no kidding. Other than that, Francis seems unique in being com- almost completely invisible. At this time, everyone had to take a side, and few people were able to sink into the background. And yet Francis seems to have managed it. Really? Which I'm sure was great for him, but not much help if you're trying to write a biographical episode about him. No. We don't have anything whatsoever? Even in meetings that we know he must have attended, for instance, when Richard announced Edward IV's pre-contract of marriage to Eleanor Butler, Francis might just as well have not been there because there's no mention of him. That's weird. But we know he must have been there because of some of the positions he was now holding. So yes. he would have been he would have been there. And also he seems to be a remarkably apolitical man. Huh. Uh, given that he was keen to fight for his possessions in the courts, and he was given more by Richard, he doesn't seem to have spent much time in any of them. And certainly he didn't use them to create a power base. It wasn't like the Stanleys. Right. This is making the Shadow of the Tower episode less and less likely, and I'm wondering how he ended up on the wrong side of Henry Tudor, if he was so apolitical. I must admit, I haven't got that far in the shadow of the, shadow of the tower yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm working my way slowly through it. <laughs> okay, he's a, he's quite the mover shaker there, yeah. and this is not at all, mm. a, at all, <laughs> the way they've portrayed him. Well, huh. he, he appears either not to have liked traveling or couldn't travel for some reason, maybe ill health. Oh, because we've seen how other men were rushing about constantly. Edward Poynings, he never stopped. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when Richard III became king, Francis became Lord Chamberlain, Chief Butler and Privy Councillor. All jobs wow. that required no travel at all. Oh. Because all these posts kept him at court. Yes. So the only travel he would have done was in progresses. Did yeah. Richard manage to get in any progresses into his short Yes. Race? Yes, he did. Okay. Uh, he went up north. It's been suggested that he may have been delicate due to the youth of his mother when she had him and the fact he was a twin. Oh, yes, premature. Mm. It's yeah. also been suggested that asthma may have been the problem, but I don't know where they got that from. Oh, asthma, tuberculosis would be more likely, considering the time period. Yeah. Hmm. But we just don't know. Of course not. He's the most frustrating <laughs> person. All the articles I read about him <laughs> said how frustrating it is doing anything. And there's a whole book about him. But <sighs> There's a book about this and this is what we've got? Yes. Oh. But as I say, it's full of things like we can only speculate that because that's all you can do. He just doesn't appear in the records. And we know he must have been there. <laughs> yes. Those are prominent roles. He should right. have been... More vocal, he... Well, I was thinking, when we did William Stanley, the bit when he was Lord Chamberlain was the bit it went, when it went quiet, because he's effectively just getting on with his job. Mm-hmm. But he was doing other things as well. He was fighting beforehand, and he was being a traitor afterwards, so we got all that bit. Francis' life is being the Lord Chamberlain, pretty much. Yes. So we're getting the bit that we don't hear much about. He's just doing his job. Perhaps. But just the Lord Chamberlain wants to be the Lord Chamberlain for having influence. Well, yeah, well, some Chamberlains were accused of restricting access to the king, to those who were in their faction, but there's no complaint about, of that sort about Francis. Yeah, sure, you can see the king. Yeah. In fact, there's no complaint of any sort about Francis. Oh, wow. Yeah. He does come across as being quite a decent person. Yes, and stayed away from any sort of faction, because most mm. of those complaints seems to be the people on the opposite side of you. Oh, yeah. You're not going to get complaints yeah. from the people you let in, I suppose. I am neutral. I am Switzerland. Yes, very much so, because during Richard's coronation, Francis was the only one in the procession who was not there for political reasons. He was there as f- friend of the king. <laughs> 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 on 19th of July, the king went on progress. And the only two people who accompanied the king for the entire progress were Francis and John de la Pole Jr. Oh. Francis' mother-in-law and sister-in-law became ladies-in-waiting to the queen. But Francis' wife didn't, and no one knows why not. Except that Francis would have been in the king's court, and maybe his wife didn't become the, the queen's lady-in-waiting because she wanted to stay with her husband 
than the king's court. They might, mm. might have been quite affectionate to each other. In order to carry favour with the king, people gave Francis gifts, such as 12 oxen from the Corporation of Salisbury. That's a lot of oxen. Yes. It's one of those presents. You wonder how pleased he was. <laughs> Especially if they present it to him in his living room. <laughs> yes, in, Lon- in the middle of London. Probably thinking, yeah, of course. <laughs> Better deal with these things now. And then they go, here you go, and they all walk out and you're yes. stuck there with 12 oxen. <laughs> well, it was assumed that he had the greatest access to the king's ear, even more so than the queen, because she received fewer gifts. Oh. Hmm. And usually there was quite a lot of resentment in a mere viscount having such power. And yet, none of the sources record, record anything like that. Mind you, he's, got, he's, he's better off than William Stanley, who was just the richest commoner, I suppose. I wonder if he's just charismatic. And that's not coming across through history. Maybe he was, or maybe he was likeable. Yeah. Hmm? Just didn't offend anybody. Yeah, just approached things in a sensible way so that nobody went yeah. away feeling hard done by. Yeah, saying, I'm really sorry, but I can't let you see the king at the moment because he's busy doing such and such. But honestly, I'll get back to you straight away. Yes. We don't come across many people like that at this time. No. We come across people who do the worst possible yes. thing at any <laughs> and time. I, and I love that we're both flabbergasted and <laughs> bewildered by this. <laughs> this makes no sense. He must have had something going wrong. Yeah. You can't just be good at your job. No. The Duke of Buckingham's Rebellion. This was stirred up after rumours that the princess in the tower had been murdered. Well, since Francis was with Richard constantly, he presumably knew what had happened to the boys. Ah, oh, and he didn't keep a secret diary that you found in that floorboard or under the flagstone? Nope. Didn't say oh. nothing. Not nothing know how. He is an annoying <laughs> man, isn't he? <laughs> I mean, we saw, as in Tyrrell's episode, that lots of people are accused of being complicit in the case, in the crime. There's no mere mention of Francis. Thomas More mentions Ratcliffe and Catesby, <laughs> but not Francis. <laughs> what the heck? Francis wrote to his neighbour, Sir William Stoner, telling him to array troops against Buckingham and to meet him in Banbury, that's in Oxfordshire. And uh, this is what makes me think he would be, he's a sort of decent one. In the letter, he said not only that it was the king's command, but also that Francis himself would be very grateful. Ah, Yeah, I mean, that's the way to get people to do things, isn't it? Yeah. Francis arrived in Banbury with his men and presumably clustered round Banbury Cross. Okay. Ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross to see a fine lady on a white horse. I don't know that one. Obviously, he didn't cross the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was wondering why you said that in such a way like I should know this. <laughs> Famous nursery to... run here, anyway. Anyway, they waited, and they waited, and they waited. So it turns out that the uh, the nice nice approach was not the right one. Ah, uh, mm. okay. Stoner had decided to fight for the other side. So I presume poor Francis must have felt foolish and then, and then betrayed. Yes. Yes. I've done everything right. I've been a kind yes. man. I've been fair to everyone. I've never picked a side. I asked you nicely. Come on. <laughs> Isn't that enough? He went on down to London to join the king and was given a general commission of array in 13 counties, which I presume means writing to the relevant people. He's not going to be running about over 13 counties. <laughs> <laughs> Asking politely and getting nowhere. <laughs> Would you mind terribly? Yeah. Yes. However, just ten days after Francis's planned meeting with Stoner, it was all over. Buckingham had got trapped by the flooded River Severn. His men had turned against him, and he'd been captured and executed. So, as far as we know, what? Francis didn't really do anything in the end. Oh, so that was abrupt. <laughs> He was involved in the aftermath, though, because he was appointed to lead a commission, quote, to arrest and imprison all rebels in the countries of Oxford and Berkshire and to take their castles, lordships, manors, lands, chattels and possessions into the king's hands, unquote. Could I please have your castle? The king wants it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, I know it's inconvenient, but if you could do me this great favor. Yes. I mean, when you're finished with it, don't don't put yourself out. Yes. You can have time to pack up. It, it's okay. Richard's first parliament was postponed due to the rebellion. But when it was finally called in December 1483, Francis was the Speaker of the House of Commons. Oh. Which was not bad, considering he only attended his first parliament ten months previously. <laughs> <laughs> In this Parliament, Richard passed laws that even the most anti-Ricardian accepts were radical and exceptionally beneficial for his subjects, including the right yes. to bail. Yes. Again, we know nothing of Francis's opinions of these laws, but then as a speaker, he was not meant to have opinions. So he made the perfect speaker, it seems. <laughs> I will be impartial and fair. Yes, because I don't care either way. Yes, naughty, naughty. Yeah. Don't say that. That's rude. <laughs> and maybe this lack of political ambition is what made Richard feel safe with him, because he certainly wasn't going to overthrow him. No. And if he did, it would be very polite. Yes. Would you mind stepping aside? No? Okay. Forget it. Forget I, forget I said anything. Yep. Yeah. yeah. No, it's fine. It's fine. With all the rents from the lands he now got, Francis' annual income was now, at the very least, £2,000 making him, in today's terms, a multi-millionaire. Ooh, that's always nice. Mm. But still, he didn't buy that headstone for his dad. He could definitely afford it now. Oh, yeah. It's thought that Richard was trying to set Francis up as the power base in the Midlands, but this failed due to Francis, quote, own inclination, unquote. <laughs> you know what? I just, I'm not feeling this at the moment. No, it's, just, it, it's, it's just not me. Yes, you're asking me to tell people what to do, and, you know, they're ignoring my letters. <laughs> I don't want to go to the Midlands. I'm sorry. I just don't want to. Yeah, can I have a beachfront, please? <laughs> <laughs> In April 1484, Francis Wood, in his capacity as Lord Chamberlain, have organised the commemorations for Richard's son, Edward, who just died after a short illness. Well, then we see a letter from Richard to his mother, Richard's mother, suggesting Francis as an estate manager, a replacement for William Collingbourne, who had just been sacked when it was discovered that he had links with, with Buckingham's rebels. And Francis got the job. But again, I think it was only nominal, or he saw it as being only nominal. <laughs> <laughs> There's no evidence that he ever went to Sicily's estates or got his hands dirty. And yet Richard had assured his mother that Francis would be perfect for the job. <laughs> It really does sound as if they're such good friends that Richard sort of believes it in some way. No, he'd be really yes. good, Mum. Honestly. Yes. Collingbourne was not happy about being sacked. He must already have been dissatisfied with Richard if he had links with rebels. But now he did something that showed his disgust at the king. He wrote a rhyme and distributed it to anyone who would take it. The cat, the rat and Lovell are dog... Ruled all England under a hog. Ah, yes. And the cat was Catesby, the rat was Ratcliffe, and the hog was Richard, since his emblem was a boar. No one else seems to have had a bad word for Lovell, which implies that his inclusion in the rhyme was more personal. Because he took away his position. Or, well, got the position. Yes. Catesby and Ratcliffe were already unpopular because they were quite low-born. They were seen as the Dudley and Empson of their time, really. Right. Collingbourne was discovered, arrested, tried, and Francis was on the jury, and hang drawn and quartered. And he was the one, Ooh. yeah, he was the one who, who was awful. When they were doing the drawing, and they just sliced into his bowels, he sat up and said, Oh, Jesus, what more trouble? What? <laughs> it's amazing that you can still in the position to do that. <laughs> They've just cut open your abdomen, and for one, you can sit up. Well, perhaps... And two, you're not screaming. Perhaps you automatically sit up. I don't know, perhaps you... I don't know. I, it's not something I want to watch to find, find out. out. Yeah. No. Although the rhyme was mentioned at the trial, it was not actually that that hanged him. What did it for him was he'd written to Henry Tudor, suggesting that Henry might like to come over and kill the king. So oh. that's what really did it for Collingbourne. <laughs> yes. Yep, that would do it. Francis' life as Lord Chamberlain kept him busy, and it was his duty to take care of the details of Richard's negotiation to marry Joanna of Avise, a Portuguese princess. 
He wouldn't do the negotiating himself, but it was up to him to organise envoys and diplomats. Why isn't he the right person? He would have been polite and probably would have... <laughs> Perhaps, it would have worked. Perhaps he just said, I'm not going to Portugal. I don't want to go to the Midlands. I'm definitely not going to Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very comfy chair here. I don't like moving. I can sympathise with him, actually. I mean, you know what it's like when you've lit the fire? <laughs> yes. You've opened a bottle Everything's of wine. Everything's comfortable. And it's like, Your friends are waiting for you at the pub. Yes. No. <laughs> you don't want to go to Portugal. <laughs> I'm going to stay home tonight. Yes. <laughs> It was also up to him to employ physicians to treat the illnesses of the royal couple. And now that Queen Anne had become ill, this was becoming even more important. And yes, the Queen isn't dead. She's just ill. And Richard is in negotiations <laughs> for a Portuguese princess. Oh. Mm, they must have known she wasn't going to get better. But still, you didn't have the decency to wait? Nope. And also, there was a rumour that France's sister, Friedersweeder, that her baby daughter, Anne, was not by her husband, but by King Richard. Dun, dun, dun. And that was a rumour going round at the time. <laughs> but after the death of Queen Anne, an envoy was sent to Portugal to carry on the negotiations about Richard's remarriage. And that envoy was not Francis. It was Edward Brampton. Small world, didn't it? Oh, yeah. But he had links with Portugal, didn't he? Having been born there, I seem to remember. I think so. It would have been up to Francis to organise Anne's funeral, and Francis would, would have also been the one to organise the meeting between King Richard and the mayor, aldermen and citizens of London, in which he denied that he was pleased that his wife was dead or that he was planning to marry his niece, Elizabeth of York. <laughs> right. Oh, that would have been so awkward. Yes. At the threat of Henry Tudor's invasion, Francis, probably along with many other men, made provisions for his wife in the event of his death. The details of the will imply that he knew that he and Anne wouldn't be having children together, but he wasn't dismissing the possibility that she would have some after he died. Maybe he knew something uh, about his own health. We don't know. Oh, yeah? What was also suggested was that his hatred of his father stemmed from sexual abuse, maybe the trauma... Uh, Come the rest of his life, but we don't know. We don't know. Hmm. Oh, that would be my button for this one. We don't know. We don't know. Francis was sent to the south coast to commandeer, fit out, and man ships. And after that, he was expected to leave the fleet. As far as we know, he'd never even been in a pedalo, never mind a ship. So. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a Lord Admiral. It was John Howard, the Duke of Norfolk. Yeah, so why? And yet it was Francis who was put in charge of the fleet. That makes no sense. No, it makes no sense. But unless it was his good organisational skills that were required rather than, you know, good sea legs. Well, because if you... Yes, but that's what the Lord Admiral does too. Mm. Maybe he was just like the supplier. I'll get you all your victuals and everything you need. Make sure the ships have been... Well, if he's manning them, commandeering them. Mm. Yeah. Why would you bypass the Lord Admiral? I don't know. I mean, the Duke of Norfolk is a very powerful, powerful yes. man. And he can't have been that happy. No. No, and the Dukes of Norfolk are renowned for not being happy. Yes. The fleet was being massed on the south coast, since, if you remember, Richard had been told by a soothsayer that Henry Tudor was going to land in Milford. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they thought it was going to be Milford, Hampshire, but as we all well, know, no, it was Milford Haven in Wales. So Wales. Francis' fleet was redundant. Probably a good thing because he didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> yes. Is that a fleet? Is th that looks like a boat. Why does it have wheels? It's made of wood. It should be a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's just hanging over the side the whole time, even before they left, left harbour. <laughs> Francis then appears to have ridden hard to reach Richard. If I'd ridden hard, I imagine him in a sedan chair. I don't see him <laughs> sleeping on a horse. He's travelling in a litter. <laughs> we know he was at the Battle of Bosworth because he was originally on Henry's list of the dead, which also included John de la Pole. But he doesn't seem to have been involved in the fighting. Oh. I'd rather Richard kept him back out of friendship. We don't know. We don't know. We don't <laughs> or, know. <laughs> or, <laughs> or he's sitting on the corner trying to breathe. <laughs> yeah, possibly. Just stay there. 
Uh, Henry's list of the dead probably included John de la Pole to prevent any rebellions rising up behind him, since he had a better claim than, than Henry did. But that doesn't explain yes. Francis' inclusion on the death list. I mean, who's going to follow him? And it appears to be just a mistake, <laughs> which seems okay. to be very Francis, doesn't it? Because most of the time he's yes. ignored. And when he is included on a list, it's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it's assumed you're dead. Yes. <laughs> well, he didn't say anything. I thought he must be dead. <laughs> Ratcliffe died on the battlefield and Catesby was executed soon after. This must have strengthened Francis in his resolve not to be discovered by Henry. Yeah. If Catesby, as Richard's right-hand man, had been executed, it did not bode well for Francis. No. So Francis fled after the battle with Humphrey and Thomas Stafford. And it's not known where they went immediately, but eventually they turned up in Colchester, in St John's Abbey, and they claimed sanctuary there. According to some... The decision to go to Colchester was because the princes in the tower had been sent there and it was up to Francis to spirit them out of the country. But who knows? Hmm. Francis and the Stafford stayed in sanctuary for about six months, which is much longer than the 40 days you're allowed to stay in sanctuary. And it has been speculated by those, by those who are into the princes in the tower conspiracy theories to mean that Henry must have allowed them to stay there because of the connection with the princes. I don't quite follow that argument but this is not the case because St. yeah i don't get that either. yeah st john's abbey had a specific right of extended sanctuary you can stay there as long as you need to ah and westminster also had that right which is why elizabeth woodville was able to stay there for so long right the following year francis was offered a pardon by henry the seventh by rights he shouldn't have needed a pardon he had fought or at least he'd, he'd attended the battle <laughs> for the lawful king of england so there was no way that could have been treasonous. Except that Henry had put the date of his reign to before yes. the Battle of Bosworth. Yes, that is so sneaky, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. But, but clever. But there was no reason for Francis not to accept the pardon, because plenty of others had, including John de la Pole. But Francis refused. Which is surprising. We know nothing of him except all of a sudden he has a backbone. Yes. Henry had killed his friend, Richard. How dare you? And maybe Francis was... Un well, I say maybe Francis was unable to forgive that. Francis was not able to forgive that. His actions from now on certainly imply that. Yes. If Francis had accepted the pardon, Henry could have done nothing to it, really, because he was too closely linked to the de, de la Pole's senior and junior. Who were now both on his council. Hmm. And why would he bother? I mean, it's just... It's just the chamber, little chamberlain. You wouldn't. I mean, you just think, well, he'll knuckle under and get on with it like the rest of them. Yeah, and so far he hasn't really been able to show that he has any influence whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Well, Francis' rejection of the pardon meant that he was attainted on the ninth of December at, at Henry's first Parliament. All his lands went to the Crown. Minster Lovell Hall went to Jasper Tudor, and Margaret Beaufort got some of his property too. Francis was declared a traitor, <laughs> meaning that if the king's men found him, he could be executed. Yeah, and as you say, this is a very brave move for someone who up to now has barely put his head above the parapet. Yes. It's a life of of two halves, definitely. This is like when you have a bunny and all of a sudden it's a killer bunny from Monty Python. What the <laughs> heck happened here? That's a good one since we watched that last night, yes. Oh, did you? <laughs> and we discovered we both knew it absolutely off by heart. Yep. <laughs> he has great teeth. <laughs> Francis had two choices at this point. He could do what most people did when faced with this predicament. He could flee into exile. Or he could start a rebellion. If he decided to do the latter, he couldn't expect foreign support, since he hadn't given himself the opportunity to contact foreign leaders to ask for that support. And yet that was what he chose to do. Margaret! Oh, Margaret! I'm a good friend of your brother! <laughs> well, it's hard to know what he thought he was going to get out of it. He had no desire to take the throne. Um, on what grounds would he do that anyway? He had been in contact with John de la Pole, but we're not sure in what capacity. And it seems as if he were just sounding him out as a potential ally rather than suggesting him as a potential king. Oh, but John de la Pole was named the heir. Yeah. But Francis hmm. seems to have given little thought to who would become king. 
This rebellion seems to be purely to avenge the death of his friend. Wow. Which is laudable in some ways, but it does, it does, he hasn't got a long-term plan, it seems. No. Well, he has absolutely no experience because he's been so placid up until yes. now. He has no idea what to do. But the lack of someone to follow would seriously hamper the rebellion. Yes. Mm. And it also seems that Francis saw his, his role as assassin rather than rabble rouser. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Assassino. Yeah. It's, it's suddenly seeing him in a completely different light. It's, it yeah. seems more like Zorro than the, than the sort of quiet little creature in a, in a cardigan that we've saw before. It makes you want to speculate that he was a bit more attached to Richard than just a friend. Yeah, maybe. He never has children with his wife and is comfortable with that. That wasn't speculated. It was one of the few things that wasn't, but Oh well, there we go. I don't I don't know of many examples in history where a good friend tries to build an army to avenge a friend's death. Lovers, on the other oh, hand. Like the Greek army of lovers. Yeah. Hmm? Well, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Revisionist <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. But how was Lovell... Sorry, I shouted that, but it came as a boom. <laughs> <laughs> but how was Lovell and the Staffords to get close enough to Henry to kill him? It was winter, so they were unlikely to get close to him then. But in the spring, the king went on progress to the north. And as Henry set off from Westminster, Francis and the Staffords set off from Colchester. They did gather some support, mainly by spreading misinformation... The Staffords got to the city of Worcester by claiming that they'd been pardoned. They then went on to spread the rumour that Edward Earl of Warwick, now I have a special friend, now I have a special friend, had been freed from the tower and was with Francis in the north of England, ready to fight to take the crown. And they spread another rumour that said that Francis had Henry as his prisoner. None of those were true. None of those were true, no. Maybe they had they had to do it because Francis said, oh, I just couldn't, I couldn't lie. <laughs> kill him but i can't lie yeah and i'm honestly hoping somebody else will wield the sword <laughs> yes. we, yeah, we, we don't hear about him doing anything of that nature but then we don't hear much i thought he died in battle yeah that's, not, that's later up to now we haven't heard anything yeah oh yes okay francis had gone on to yorkshire on his own i don't know if the, i don't think that's literally on his own but without the staffords he had better luck than Stafford's because the North was more loyal to Richard than the Midlands had been. The North had even welcomed a Scottish invasion if it would get rid of Henry. <laughs> this rebellion is often pretty much ignored, and yet it had more, more support than the Buckingham Rebellion. Those in the North were afraid of losing the standing they'd been given under Richard. Right. And were happy to side with someone who was planning to kill him. Oops. Henry was tipped off that Francis was leading a rebellion... In a conversation we've come across before, Sir Hugh Conway, or Convey, I've seen both, went to the king to warn him, and he even knew the exact date when Francis Henry was planning to leave sanctuary. But when he, he was asked to reveal his sources, he said he wouldn't, even if he were to be drawn by wild horses. Whereupon, quote, Wild horses were found? <laughs> Whereupon, quote, the king was angry and displeased with me for my goodwill, unquote. And we heard about this conversation in Richard Nanfan, Nanfan's episode. Nanfan! <laughs> Conway was one of the men who'd had that treasonous conversation in Nanfan's house in Calais, and he was the one who warned against tipping Henry off about their suspicions of Lord Dobney because of how he'd been treated when he tried to tell Henry about Francis's rebellion. Right. Yes. <laughs> Don't, don't bother. You're, you're just going to get getting into trouble yourself. Yeah, yeah, he likes to go after the messenger. Yes. <laughs> and it's interesting that Henry seems to have had no inkling of the rebellion. And even when told about it, he wouldn't believe it. Oh, wait, Francis? F Francis. Who? Are we talking about the same <laughs> yes. Francis? Well, Francis was able to get out of sanctuary without being apprehended. Because nobody believed he was there. <laughs> No, no, no. He, he's, isn't he in the drawing room reading a book? <laughs> well, maybe he heard that Conway was talking to Henry and changed the date of his planned departure. 
The Croydon Chronicle reporting the rebellion doesn't mention Lovell. I mean, poor Francis, he's not even mentioned in reports <laughs> on his own rebellion. <laughs> oh, no. However, proclamation against Francis were issued before he reached York with the intention of assassinating the king. So hopefully it wasn't 2,000 words this time. Henry's preparation for the rebellion, according to Polydor Virgil, writing 20 years later, quote, but since this development called for diligence, lest time be given to his adversaries for increase in their forces, he commanded Duke Jasper of Bedford to go against the enemy with 3,000 lightly armed men, a goodly part wearing leather breastplates, and advised him of his own plans. In the meantime, he himself gathered what soldiers he could, unquote. So Henry also commissioned others to array troops, including the Stanleys. And it was obvious he was expecting to fight a fairly large forces. I hmm, don't think that was going to happen. No. In the event, not a shot was fired because Jasper offered pardons to those who threw down their weapons. But if that was the case, it didn't apply to all the rebels or Henry was being disingenuous because he did put some rebels on trial. Well, Francis didn't get a pardon. He did a perkin in that he crept away at night and left his men to face the music. (laughs) (laughs) And at that, all all his men accepted the pardon. As Polydor Virgil put it, Francis, more fearful of danger than avid for glory, ran non-stop into the county of of Lancaster. Unquote. I love the idea of (laughs) running (laughs) up. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. (laughs) happened to my litter bears <laughs> <laughs> but polydor may not have got this entirely right events seem to have gone in the other direction the troops left francis before he left him maybe. i could see that <laughs> james would have been like uh no you're on your own yes <laughs> we thought this was a rebellion but it really isn't is it <laughs> no no there are more of them than there are of us i think so there are a lot more of them and you neglected to bring swords I think because you've I'm, never I'm going done home. this before. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. But Francis wasn't fi- finished. He took a few men and went on to York, where he intended to ambush Henry and either kidnap him or kill him. There's been some dispute about that. Um, you get, get the impression he's like Cato from the Pink Panther. You know? He's hiding yes. in wardrobes <laughs> and leaping out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And completely ineffectual. Yes. <laughs> Virgil says that the court was tense. Richard III was still popular in the north. If Henry were attacked by Lovell and his men, would any of the people of York go to his aid? Or would they join in and make things worse for Henry? I mean, Henry's Henry's been quite brave just to go there, really, with all his many thousands and thousands of men. (laughs) (laughs) According to the, the Croyland Chronicle, it was apparently a fluke that Henry Percy, the Earl of Northumberland, spotted the rebels. Or it's possible that Francis contacted Northumberland to try and bring him into the conspiracy, but that backfired. And Northumberland may have said he just happened to spot the rebels by accident, because although it would look good for him to have refused the offer to join the rebellion, it does imply that Francis must have thought he was a bit ropey in his loyalty to Henry to have asked him in the first place. (laughs) Hey, (laughs) I heard you don't like Henry. I do. I do. I like I really like him. Are you sure? (laughs) (laughs) But it was either Northumberland's good fortune or his loyalty to Henry which defeated the rebels. Some rebels were caught and hanged the same day. Francis laid low in York, being hidden in people's houses. (laughs) Can I please have a cup of cocoa while we wait? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, if you don't mind, I'm just going to put my feet up for a few minutes. Fire's nice and warm over here. <laughs> yeah, but it does show that people were willing to hide him because presumably there was a reward. So he, yeah. he was hidden until he was able to flee the city. But it's probably because he's so polite yes. and he's off with his feet up in front of the fire knitting a sweater. Yes. <laughs> There's no way this man could be part of the rebellion. So, he says he's Francis Lovell, but I don't think it is. No, it can't be. <laughs> leave him, leave him be. I expect he's mad. <laughs> <laughs> the Stafford brothers went into sanctuary in Abingdon with Abbot Sante. Henry arrested them anyway, saying that there was no sanctuary for traitors. Right. 
And we don't know where Francis went or whom he stayed with. If Virgil was right, he went to Lancashire, where he may have stayed with Thomas Broughton, who went on to help... Or Broughton. Thomas Broughton. He went on to stay with Thomas Broughton, who went on to, to help Francis and John de la Pole when they landed with Lambert Simnel. Francis was in hiding for around nine months. So, and yet no one betrayed him. I mean, that's pretty good going. I am starting to wonder... Francis doesn't actually exist. Oh. He's brought up every once in a while as a focus for something. And the reason he's never caught or nobody has any complaints about him is because he doesn't actually exist. It's like all these Robin characters yes. that, that are brought up yes. and then people are, 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 are rebel in the name of Robin of Riersdale or somewhere. But they, yes. it's just a name. Yes. Wow. This is by becoming very revisionist. Rich the Rich the Third is gay, <laughs> and Francis Lovell doesn't exist. <laughs> but then, if he doesn't exist, Richard Third doesn't have to be gay. <laughs> <laughs> very true. <laughs> but I mean, you could pull out since nobody knows who he is because mm. he's so in the background of everything. You could pull out anybody and say it's Francis Lovell. Yeah, he's like the Scarlet Pimpernel. Yes. Wow. Fancy us doing an episode on someone who doesn't exist. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Um, By January 1487, Francis and a few other men were known to be out of the country and in Burgundy with Auntie Margaret. Polydor Virgil reckoned it was Francis who convinced Margaret to join the rebellion, but I can't imagine she took much persuading. No, we're we're not happy with Henry. I'm in! (laughs) (laughs) Stamping her foot. (laughs) At the beginning of the next month, Henry was with his privy council in Sheen. John de la Pole attended the first of the meetings, and then it was discovered he'd left the court. In fact, he was already overseas and on his way to Burgundy. And soon after, Elizabeth Woodville was sent to a monastery in Bermondsey. So, coincidental, or was was, did Henry suspect her of being in contact with the rebels? Lambert Simnel. There were a lot of discrepancies in the Lambert Simnel story, which we'll go into in his own episode. The timing of the events, just uh, they don't add up. He was said to have gone over to Burgundy with John de la Pole, the Earl of Lincoln. Okay. So presumably Francis would have come across him over there. Although the fact that we don't know where Francis was, up to the point where he tried to flee, right? he could have met him in England. We just don't know. We don't know anything about Francis. <laughs> Again, he doesn't exist. Yeah. It seems likely... That Francis hadn't really looked into who they should follow. <laughs> the most ill-conceived plan. Yes. <laughs> well, you assume it's got to be Edward Earl of Warwick or John de la Pole. Once they're on in Burgundy, they could start perfecting their plan. Or creating one. The others have got plans, whether he has or not. <laughs> <laughs> there are contemporary accounts of this, but these must inevitably have been based on hearsay. And again, Francis is barely mentioned in them, despite presumably being one of the main plotters. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was because Lincoln had pretended to be loyal, so he became the great hate figure. Ah. Francis' antics have been a bit farcical, so... Yeah, maybe he was less so. Yeah, point to one success that you have had in any battle, rebellion, or scuffle. We'll take fisticuffs. Yes. <laughs> we'll take accidentally spilling someone's pint. That will do. <laughs> Polydor Virgil mentions him, though not nearly as much as Lincoln. But he admits to mention the f- he admits he admits to mention Francis' close relationship with Richard, making his rebellion mm. completely inexplicable. <laughs> Yes, I found that too. It sort of was dis- disconnected from anything mm. with the way Polydor put it together. Yeah. If you don't understand the friendship, what's he doing? It just happens <laughs> out of the blue. Yeah. yeah. Plenty of Yorkists had to submit it to Henry, or if they didn't feel that they could do that, they went into exile. So, with, yeah, without mention of Richard, yeah, you're left wondering, what, what's the point? <laughs> but I did find it easy to understand why. Francis should have followed Simnel, then that John de la Pole should have done so, because Francis's overriding aim was to get rid of Henry. If following the son of an organ maker from Oxford could do it, well, fine. <laughs> do that, whatever it takes. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. <laughs> oh, he, 
Yeah, it probably wasn't that interested whether John de la Pole disposed quietly of the boy or whatever they planned to do afterwards. I mean, if, if he got rid of Henry, that's it. Francis would, Good got, Francis would probably just gone home by that point. Said, OK, I've done, yes. I've done what I came to do. Yeah. And I'm missing my cocoa. <laughs> yes, you'll have a skin on it now. It's going to be horrible. <laughs> There were three months between Francis and Lincoln arriving in Burgundy and the troops setting out for Ireland. And in the interim, Margaret of Burgundy was raising and arming Swiss mercenaries. In May 1487, Francis Lincoln and Lambert Simnel set off for Ireland. Or Simnel was already in Ireland. Again, the timeline is ambiguous. Right. And as well as Margaret's Swiss mercenaries, Maximilian sent German mercenaries. Or at least according to the chronicler Molinet. <laughs> did he? I don't know. <laughs> or if he did, did he pay them? Probably not. No. <laughs> I'll pay you when you get back, okay? Honestly. Yes. Honestly. Yes. Francis was at the ceremony to crown Simnel and at the feast afterwards. But again, there's no mention of him. We can only surmise he was there because he must have been there. <laughs> I mean, it'd be, it'd be stranger if he weren't. Would it? <laughs> we don't know if he attended the Fay Parliament at Drogheda. <laughs> oh, boy. But you would think that one of, as one of the main instigators, he would have. But he wasn't a political animal, so who knows? Back in England, though, Francis was thought to be dangerous. Because <laughs> they didn't know him. John Paston <laughs> was advised not to visit Anne Lovell. Francis's wife, for fear of being thought suspect. As we don't know if Anne supported her husband in her rebellion, she's always portrayed as the abandoned wife. But it is possible that she took a more active role. One of the more reasons that Paston was wary of being suspect was that he had passed on information to Henry about Francis' whereabouts that had been proved wrong. Ooh, ooh. If he'd been visiting Anne, could she have deliberately given him information to draw the hounds off her husband? Ah, mm. or she's quite happy that she doesn't have a husband and nobody knows about it. Yes. <laughs> she doesn't marry again, so. When the troops landed in northeast England, Francis was with the German mercenaries. There they are. Whether they've been paid or not, they're there. <laughs> <laughs> they come in. He said you would pay. Yes. He said <laughs> what? <laughs> they marched the 100 miles to Bramham Moor where they intercepted Lord Clifford before he could reach Henry's other soldiers in York. Uh, I was a bit confused about the Cliffords, because this is the time between when the Cliffords were attainted by Edward IV, after um, okay. the Battle of Tower, I think, and when Robert Clifford's testimony did for William, the, William Stanley. So by rights, there shouldn't have been any Cliffords, but so I'm not sure where this Lord Clifford fits in. Maybe so someone going around but calling himself Lord Clifford, even though he's not meant to. <laughs> Francis led the Yorkist troops. Really? Yes. And he... Wait, 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 wait. Did he have a name tag on the back, <laughs> like a jersey today, so everybody knew who he was? He probably gave him a little pep talk at the beginning. Now, has everybody got everything? You got your lunch? Okay. Right, we're going to kind of tap Have you, you gone to the bathroom? Yes. <laughs> you won't be able to go once we start. <laughs> no, you're going to be surprised. They took Clifford by surprise at night, and Clifford's men were forced to flee. Ah! Oh, oh my goodness! Well, that one by, tr by tricking them and arriving at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did say he's more of an assassin than a than a soldier. John de la Pole, the Earl of Lincoln, was not allowed to enter York because the city of York had decided to side with Clifford Henry. and Henry Percy as well. The the Earl of Northumberland was there. And so de la Pole met Henry's troops at East Stoke on June the 16th. Yeah. Francis had joined him on the 12th. The Yorkist army was led by Francis, John de la Pole, and the Earls of, the Earls of Desmond and Kildare, and Martin Schwartz. Schwartz. <laughs> de la Pole and Martin, and Martin Schwartz were killed in the fighting, but Francis was not on the list of the dead. Because <laughs> <laughs> everyone said, was he here? <laughs> <laughs> the York Civic Records reported that he was, quote, discomforted and fled, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm actually, I'm not very comfortable here. 
Yes, yes. You you go on without me. I'll catch yeah. up. <laughs> Actually, I saw a really nice looking pub just down the road. I'll see you there. He was last seen on his horse crossing the River Trent. So what happened to him? Yes. There were several contemporary theories, and by several, I mean loads. <laughs> oh, no. But, well, I'm not going through them all. Polydor Virgil said he died in battle. Edward Hall and Ralph, Ralph Hollingshead said that he died soon after the battle, presumably of injuries. But they were both writing the following century. So, A reasonable supposition was that he went to his mother's house. His mother was dead by then, but she had a, their property in Stoke Bardolph, which was just 13 miles from the battlefield where, again, it's said to have probably died of his injuries. And there's a grave in the local church of a soldier who was said to have fought in the Battle of Stoke. It could be Francis. See, he didn't actually exist. He never existed. His dad hasn't got a gravestone. He hasn't got a gravestone. (laughs) (laughs) Going to look a bit suspicious. Or he could have gone to Burgundy. Or he could have fled to Scotland. He was on a list of people given safe conduct by James the Fourth to Scotland in 1488. But does that mean he was actually in contact with Francis, or was he offering it as a sort of general blanket? You know, if if, if any of you are alive, you, you can come to Scotland. Hmm. But the York record mentions that a quote simple and pure person unquote had met Francis in Scotland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or he was given sanctuary by Maximilian in the Holy Roman Empire. Or others thought he'd fled to Minster Level Hall and died there. I think he's with Loch Ness Monster. Yes. He and Nessie are having dinner yes. and Coco. Along with the Yeti. To, <laughs> to go back to the come with me if you will bit. Yes. It's said that in the 18th century, a skeleton was found in an underground chamber. People put two and two together and thought, Missing Lord Lovell, skeleton in Minster Lovell Hall. It must be Francis Lovell. Sadly, this seems very unlikely. Okay. I checked on Google Maps. The quickest route from East Stoke, Not- Nottinghamshire, to Minster Lovell, Oxfordshire, is down the A46 and is 106 miles. And it would take Ooh. it would take you two hours and 14 minutes by car. It would take you weeks. Yes. If he'd been injured, would he have travelled all that way? Uh, he was near York. Surely he must have known someone who could have hidden him. He didn't seem to have any trouble finding people to hide him the last time round. Unless he didn't exist. Yes. Well, <laughs> he might have thought there's no place like home and gone back to Minster Lovell. But Minster Lovell wasn't home anymore. It was Jasper Tudor's home. Oh, yeah. yeah, you couldn't exactly show up, knock on the door. Hello. Um, I'm not feeling well. Is Coco <laughs> still on the team? <laughs> So I've no idea who that poor man who was in the underground cave, but it wasn't Francis Lovell. But there was actually a man there in was an someone underground under there, cave. Yeah. Hmm. It seems he couldn't have hidden out with his wife unless she was a very good actress, since she was writing to John Paston, amongst others, to find out where her husband was. In 1489, Anne took a religious vow. So she seems to have decided or known that Francis was dead by then and she decided not to marry again. Hmm. even though she was only 28. Either that shows a strong affection towards Francis, or, as you suggested, she decided that one husband was quite enough. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Done that. I'm done. It's thought she didn't actually become a nun because it's later known she looked after her nephews by Francis' twin sister, Joan. Okay. But it seems fitting we don't know what happened to him. Because it fits with the pattern of his life. <laughs> yes, it very much does. Because <laughs> I, I saw him not as not existing, but I just felt that he was the invisible man right to the very end. <laughs> yes. And continues to this day. So, hmm. that's it. Oh, goodness. Now we have to try to rate this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you're trying to rate someone who isn't, doesn't exist, and I'm trying to rate the invisible man. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> And fibbly. Intrigue. I, zero. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to give him much for Amphibole. Are you going to just go zero all the way through because he doesn't exist? <laughs> no. No, I'm going to assume he exists. So I'm actually going to give him a one for working with Margaret of Burgundy mm. to actually start a rebellion. I'm giving him a one. I think he's got to get something because he, he had, when well, he's two rebellions, really, he had his own rebellion and then Lambert Simnels. 
But his outlook seems to have been very simple. Kill the king. The king had killed my friend. Killed the king. It's There's no intrigue. There's no finesse. No. It's almost as if... I've never seen The Born Identity. You won't be surprised to hear, but I gather... <laughs> I gather he's somewhat, somehow triggered in some way, isn't he? Uh, Has he been in, something's been implanted well, first in his... they try to kill him. I thought, I thought, oh, Maltese Falcon. Is that one of them? This where some, something's happened and he's triggered into doing something. Well, one of the Bourne movies, the woman that he falls in love with is killed because they're continuing to try to kill him. And then he starts taking everybody out rather than just trying to live. Yeah, and I've never seen the Maltese Falcons, so I don't know. Right, I'd probably leave all this bit out then. It seems to be completely John irrelevant. Wick. We'll go with John Wick. No, we can't go with John Wick because John Wick actually can kill people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave it at a two. Two rebellions, two points. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> antiperistasis. I mean, he got up and down. I mean, that's that's what you asked for, really, an antiperistasis. But he did he, though? He didn't really go up and down. He became he a Viscount, didn't... which is a thing. It's a, But it's just a word. Yes. No title or money went with it. Or, I mean, no lands or money went with it. He certainly went down. Yes, he definitely went down. So I'm going to give him points for that, because antiperistasis is down as well as up. True. I'm going to give him... Four. Because four. Oh, I'm th- no, hang on, I'm thinking. <laughs> I was, no, I'm going to give him th- justification for that four. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll give him three because I'll give him a bit more if he was actually executed. But for all we know, he got away and lived a lovely life in Scotland, stroke Burgundy, stroke Hodoran Empire, stroke Hawaii, for all we know. <laughs> His own house where Jasper Tudor didn't realise he was there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, what are you giving him? Anything? Well, he definitely went down. I mean, ultimately, what happened to him was catastrophic for his status in society. Yes. <laughs> Especially if he's dead. Yes. Um, I'll give him a two. Because he did get the Viscountcy and then he died. Yeah. Okay. Martyrdom. Zero. He fled. <laughs> Well, he gave up everything to avenge Richard, which is a sort of martyrdom. True. He was risking his own life to avenge his friend. But did he risk? Because he, he left a bunch of these. He was, he was hiding in wardrobes and things, waiting to jump out at Henry. <laughs> and presumably, <laughs> once he'd killed Henry, he wasn't going to get away. True. And he did die, ultimately, we think. Somehow. Actually, I'll give him a four. He didn't do anything crazy, but it wasn't wasn't effective. And it's 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 quite it's a noble thing. Stand up for your friend, who was creepy as all get out and may have killed children. <laughs> well, that makes it even more of a thing, doesn't it? That he's, he's staying next. To... <laughs> what would you say? Four. I said four. I'm going to go for five because yeah, he risked his life for his friend, and well, I think that's good. Okay. Beating. Has to be zero. They didn't even know who he was then. <laughs> well, he has a village named after him, but then I suppose most so does most of the nobility. We will go to Minster Lovell to this day. Does he, or was it named after his family? His family. His, then that's not him. <laughs> <laughs> he took a prominent role in endowing Magdalen College, Oxford. Did he? Yes. Are we sure? <laughs> Yes. He founded a chantry there to pray for the souls of himself and his wife. Not his father. Not his father. <laughs> but unfortunately, that was a victim of the 16th century reform, so you can't still see that. In t- On the 20th of February, 1484, Lovell was granted a license with John Russell, Bishop of Lincoln, and John, Duke of Suffolk, his former guardian, to found a fraternity at St. Helens, Abingdon, Oxfordshire. I went to school at St. Helens in Abingdon. So. And you didn't know about him. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I know about Minster Lovell was that there was an article in the paper years and years and years ago that they hunted cats. Now, that's all I can remember about that. If anyone lives in Minster Why? Lovell, was there ever an episode of cat hunting? 
Anyway. Yes, this fraternity was to have 12 masters and would be called the Fraternity of the Holy Cross. And for this purpose, a li the licence allowed the guild to be endowed with land to the value of £100 to be used for good works, like the supporting of 13 poor men and women and two chaplains to celebrate Mass daily for the good estate of Richard and his wife and their son. And unless I got entirely the running end of the stick, this grant still exists and now its main function is to repair the road between Abingdon and Dorchester. So if you're driving between Abingdon and Dorchester and you're really impressed by the quality of the road, it's Francis Lovell you've got to thank. Hmm. <laughs> no? Hmm. Okay, you're not impressed with that. Uh, well, no, that is pretty impressive if it keeps going. Mm. And he does have the poem that names him, sort of. <laughs> That's true, yes. The dog. That's true, yes. It's a lovely poem that uh, calls him a dog. So I'm assuming that British would know him if they heard that. Is that rhyme still fairly Not really. well known there? Not really. No. no. So no. No. I'll give him one for the road. He lost everything, so he didn't have anything to hand down. His no. apparent reluctance to create a power base means he didn't build an infrastructure like Thomas Stanley. We don't hear of him doing any substantial building apart from Magdalen College, Oxford. Uh, he doesn't have children. He appears in Shakespeare's Rich the Third. That's got to be something. But he's the hench mm -hmm. henchman who was given the task of executing Hastings, which is not true, but it is a not form true. of the team. Yes, so everybody who ever studies Shakespeare and Richard III would know of him. Mm, they just wouldn't know the true story. That's a two. So, I can't give him much for a team. I'll give him a two. One for the college and one for the road. <laughs> <laughs> just one more for the road. Uh, yeah, two seems... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Flaunt a bleeding flaunt. Flaunt a flaunt, oh dear. I did. Oh, poor. That's not a picture. <laughs> yeah. We've got a blue plaque. Which, pe for people outside Britain, it's a metal sign that's put up in places where people of note have lived or worked. And it's very prestigious to get a blue plaque. Tameside Metropolitan Borough. Francis Lovell. Oh, they've given him a death date. That's a lie. <laughs> yes. Tameside which I had to look up, is in Greater Manchester. Okay. Lord of Longdale, favourite of Richard III, mm -hmm. his chief butler and chamberlain of the household fought at the Bottle of Bosworth on the 22nd of August, 1485. Perhaps not. He could have mm -hmm. sat off to the side and, and just drank his cocoa and tried to breathe. Yes. Later, in an abortive uprising against Henry VII, following the Battle of Stoke, Lovell's body was not found, but there is a tradition that in 1708 his body was discovered in a chamber at Minster Lovell, which you've just said is impossible, yep. his home near Oxford. When exposed to fresh air, the skeleton crumbled to dust, unveiled jointly by Councillor blah, 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 in well, August 2001. When you look at the amount of words there, there's actually more words about the man in the, in the secret chamber than there is about in the real Lovell. <laughs> Yes, there is. <laughs> oh, Lovell. And there's, okay. a, there's a picture. So far... Yeah, I know. Not going to say, but there's an it looks like an uh, illumination from manuscript, and it shows someone who's meant to be Lovell. I'm sorry. Is he on the left? Yes. He appears if to be wearing a crown. he's on the crown. left, why is he putting a crown on his head? I have serious doubts this is Lovell. <sighs> uh, uh, mm. Yeah. Well, it said it, he was being welcomed into the um, sanctuary in Colchester. And that's a picture of him okay, arriving. Okay, his, his horse is tiny. <laughs> He's got a tiny head. The, um, the bishop that is welcoming him into the abbey is taller than the horse. Mm. And then the people behind him look like munchkins, except they look like they're on their knees with the way it's been painted. <laughs> <laughs> they look like they might be praying. I assume they were on their knees, but they... Oh, is it... If they are on their knees, that doorway is very short. <laughs> the, bishop's on, I mean, the bishop's on his knees, which makes the horse even smaller. <laughs> there appears to be a giant black centipede crawling up the hill behind them as well. I'm not sure. Yeah, what it looks kind of like a spider. 
<laughs> Maybe they're supposed to be ferns. I don't know, but that abbey is even smaller then if they're all on their knees. The doorway is barely above the one kid's head. You can see why perspective would seem to be so magical, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's meant to be him being welcomed into sanctuary. But what is that crown? I, I was dubious about it, but <laughs> it's the only picture we have of him. And I don't think it's him. <gasps> I don't think it's him either. But that's as it should be. If he's an invisible man, he should. He should. He should be. <laughs> maybe he's a vampire. He doesn't pick. Doesn't show up in pictures. Maybe. Oh, maybe they've put him in gold armor. Yeah. On a white horse. Hmm. <laughs> he's got a bit of a mullet going on as well, doesn't he? <laughs> yes, he does. Short in the front, long in the back. Yeah. Unless it's supposed to be the hood of his half cloak. Mm. I love the way his knees uh, are hinged. You can imagine when he moves his knees, yeah. it sort of goes... Eh, 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 eh. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, he's a robot. I can't give him anything. I'm I don't going think it's to him. Give... No, I'm going to give him a one for the humour factor. <laughs> yeah, I'll give him a one for and the fact... giving him a zero? We enjoy... No, I'll give him a one for the fact we enjoyed the picture, even though we don't think it's him. <sighs> I don't think he's done very well. <laughs> His total is 22. Ooh. That's not bad for a man who maybe didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, he beat out Louis the Twelve. Did he? Good heavens. Yes. God, Louis did far more. Why did, I wonder why we voted him so low. Oh, he beat out Arthur Tudor, Prince of Wales, and Edward Plantagenet. Oh, poor little Edward. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Yeah, so he's third in the rankings. Mm. Uh, yeah, third from the bottom, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's as it should be. We couldn't be right at the bottom because that would be too much of um, showing himself in the limelight. He'd want to be sort of somewhere near <laughs> the bottom so no one would take any notice of yes. him. Yes. So yeah. everybody just sort of ignores the fact that he's there. Mm. And because of that, there's no way he could be too delicious. He would hate that spotlight. That's true. That's true. So we're actually doing him a favour by booing him. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> we are allowing him to slink away while we're cheering on somebody else. <laughs> yes. I don't feel bad about him not getting too delicious because now he doesn't want it. You can't even use the boo soundtrack. Can't I? Hmm. No, because nobody would know he's there. Oh, that's true. Unless you make it into a ghostly boo. Right, hang on. We'll do, <laughs> we'll do a, a, a ten second silence then. Okay. That's enough. I think... Yeah. Empty air. It's, it's not empty air. It's, oh, it's um, quite painful to listen to, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, leave it in. Leave it in. <laughs> I feel sorry for him. All he wanted to do was kill the king. <laughs> we think. <laughs> yeah. And then have a cup of coke yes. in front of the fire with maybe bunny slippers on his feet. <laughs> no. Can I have someone else now, please? <laughs> okay. I just realised something. This episode has gone on for over two hours. This is the long I think one of the longest episodes <laughs> I've done. <laughs> on a non existent person <laughs> ever. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Reginald Bray. Oh. The precursor to Dudley and Ampson. Isn't it funny? We were we were out of England for ages and now we can't get can't get out of England. <laughs> Because yes. you're doing Bishop Fox. We're now we're now in the um, Privy Council. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Okay. Reg I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah. And see if he was as bad as um, Dempsey and Makepeace, I keep wanting to call Nobody him. Nobody <laughs> could be as bad as Dudley and Epson. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Okay. Actually, I'm looking forward to that. Yep. Well, we, mm -hmm. we will see a bit more of, um, of Henry's style of governing as well from his... Because we yes. haven't had anyone for the... Well, I say we haven't had anyone from the Privy Council. We've had both Stanleys. 
Yes, but Reginald was a bit more influential, I think. Yeah, I think since so. Since a lot of what followed on was him training the people below him. Mm. At least that's what it said in the Margaret Beaufort episode, because she was one of his counselors, her counselors. He was one of her <laughs> counselors. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, jolly good. Give it a go. First Reginald we've had anyway. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the end of our episode on Viscount Francis Lovell, possibly a phantom. <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed it, and will join us for the next episode on Bishop Richard Fox. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. You can find details of the podcast and contact us on... In the meantime, if I can catch him once upon the hip, I will feed fat the ancient grudge I bear him. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. That sounds quite dramatic for him, actually, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> I went for the revenge part of it rather than the cocoa part. <laughs> anyway, goodbye. Goodbye. Really am the invisible